Um, in uh, this video, um, we're going to introduce all the different components needed for realizing a robust uh, black box analysis. But before we go there, let's take a step back and let's look at where um, simulations are used in the Y. So um, mechanical simulations like this bar here, that is fixed on one side and there is load put on the other side, it's very common in mechanical engineering to estimate where stresses uh, accumulate and where potential breaking points of the parts uh, will be. Um, in um, uh, the aerospace industry, uh, simulation of uh, fluids, uh, in this case of uh, air, are very important for um, testing how uh, the design will perform before fabricating them and doing uh, measurements uh, on the actual parts. Um, in this example, a simulation is used to um, simulate and uh, predict what will happen during a car crash. So this is uh, commonly done um, in the prototyping phases to decide how components will be arranged and uh, how to potentially reinforce uh, the car to make sure that when the shock happens, it is absorbed without uh, propagating to where the people are uh, sitting. Um, a more complex scenario, uh, this is a simulation of a heart that includes uh, simulating uh, the organ and how um, the fluids uh, moves. This is a very complex simulation that is uh, placing together deformable objects with fluids And uh, this kind of uh, approaches is uh, starting to be used in the medical field, again, for uh, predictive purposes. In uh, graphics, uh, we are used to, uh, to use simulation, for example, to simulate in this case how snow moves and uh, when interacts with uh, uh, other objects. Um, another application of snow simulation is uh, for predicting uh, possible uh, disasters. Um, simulation has been around for a very long time and um, uh, initially was used to predict astronomical position, eclipses and other astrological purposes. Uh, and actually the first uh, general purpose computer was actually um, designed and invented for um, solving uh, at this point simple uh, simulations. Um, but how does it look uh, now? So this is a, an example from a modern software. And in here we are trying to set up a reasonably simple simulation. So we have a block on the left, which is fixed. And we have another block on the right, which is free to move. Uh, and we have something else in between. So the block on the right is actually being pushed toward the fixed block. And so we expect this part in the middle to compress. And if you try to set up uh, this uh, simple scenario in an existing software, you are going to run into a lot of issues. Um, some, these are some um, comments, uh, that some of the problems that we encounter while doing this. So things like it's important to draw domain right next to each other, or the model should be solved using a specific option called auxiliary sweep with small parametric steps, or you need to be careful what is your step size. So all of these makes it very difficult for people that are not um, engineers and have studied the software to use them. Um, so if you do everything right, you're going to get the result that you expect. If you don't, there are going to be problems. In this case, overlaps that are absolutely not physical and it's something that you cannot use for prediction purposes. So uh, how does it look like? So the current design pipeline that uh, we would like to have is something where the user provides us a model and um, provide us a set of boundary condition. In this case, someone is going to sit on the chair and we want to know what's happening. And if the chair deforms too much or there is too much stress, we want to go back, take this result to change the original geometry, simulate again, and make sure that nothing goes wrong. And right now, this pipeline requires a lot of manual effort and it has really been optimized to have a human in the loop, always fixing things whenever things goes wrong. And what we would like to do instead is to make this entire procedure completely automated. So there can be an algorithm that takes the output of the simulation, computes derivatives, and is able to directly modify the design to address eventual issues. The problem with this is that if you want to have such a pipeline, everything has to be absolutely automatic and there should be no uh, user in the loop. So in general, 
there has been a lot of research on how to model the geometry of shapes, um, both on the graphic side and on the uh, CAD side. And uh, the focus here is really on geometry appearance. But on the other hand, other important aspects such as is an object fabricable with a specific technology or is it stable or is it robust after fabrication or maybe like can I slightly modify it to reduce the cost or the weight? All of these are very hard criteria and what we are trying to do is to have an automated pipeline that allows to use simulation to improve these aspects without having the user to worry about them. Um, and we would like to work on real world objects, things that look like this, where if you try existing pipelines, they might not even be able to open such a model. And what we would like to do instead is to do optimization and to design objects of this complexity. Um, this problem of automation and robustness is becoming particularly relevant with the, the introduction of um, machine learning, where it's now common to process huge collection of models. And when you are in the millions of models, there is nothing that you can do manually to each one of them. It will be just too expensive. So it's important to have uh, pipelines that can be used to batch process data. And this is a topic, for example, for trying to use a data-driven model for physics. This is a very hot topic for which many papers have been introduced in the last year. Um, connected to these is robotics, where we want to uh, simulate uh, paths of, in this, this case, a robotic arm to check that it is safe and it's satisfying its purpose. Um, other example are behavior optimization of material. We want to use a single base material, but changing the geometry, we can get it to deform in a way that we prescribe. Or to design processes for a specific person, where we start from a medical image and then we design a processes for that person and then we um, simulate how it will behave. And um, unfortunately, we are very far from there. And uh, as you saw in the conventional software before, it's very, it's, there's a lot of manual work still. But so let's focus on one specific case study to try to understand why uh, this is so difficult. And let's take the trader mesh. So the task is I give you a surface mesh, in this case, a triangle mesh. And I give you the tetrahedra, then I say, and I give you only the triangle. Then what I want to get is a collection of tetrahedras inside this surface. And there are many softwares that can do this. Uh, one is uh, Seagull, another one is TedGen, LPSC, and many more. And um, when I try to use this software, one of the problems I always had is that my models were never good enough. They always had small imperfections, like a, a hole somewhere or a certain perception or maybe like a triangle of bad quality. And so I had to go by hand and fix my models until this procedure could be performed. And this is an important procedure because most of the standard simulation methods actually rely on, on, a, on a mesh, a volumetric mesh. So I wanted to know what happens if it's just me being unlucky and having bad models or if bad models are common. So this is a collection extracted from uh, Fingy 10K of 10,000, um, it is the Fingy Fing 10K collection of 10,000 models in the wild, downloaded from a website that contains a collection of uh, scan model, CAD models, manually designed objects, and uh, procedurally generated objects. So what happens if we try to tetralize these objects? And the result is that it's the success rate of this method is pretty low. And the reason why it's so low is because they assume that the input has to be clean. Um, and this is really far from being something that can be used robustly in a pipeline like what I described before. Because there, if we need to have it work every time, we're trying to take a gradient. So the only acceptable option here is to have a success rate of 100%. And 79% is still pretty far from it. So why is it so difficult? So there are many reasons. But the main, main one is that uh, the existing problem state for many of the steps in, uh, in a, a simulation pipeline impose strong assumption on what the input should be. And they just refuse to process data that doesn't satisfy these requirements. And while this is in general um, OK if you want to do things by hand, if you try to automate things, the code needs to be and the algorithm needs to be robust to small imperfections in the input. 
in practice, most of the real data actually has problems. Uh, also, the way models were modeled using traditional tools, for example, using uh, primitive nerves, um, they do, by construction, introduce a lot of the general configuration. I mean, a model made of nerves, usually it's not closed and it has self intersections by construction. And so it's impossible to expect it to be clean. And it's important with algorithms that can deal with these issues. Also, implementing algorithms that use floating point, it's very hard because there are a lot of corner cases. And so if an algorithm is proved to be correct in arbitrary precision, uh, for example, uh, the loan tetralization, it's still very hard to implement it in floating point. And uh, here you really have two choices. Uh, you can either do it right, and this increases complexity of the algorithm, or you ignore it. And in any case, getting something that works reliably, it's a very, very hard task. In particular, when many of these methods were introduced, large collection of data were not available. And so it was just not possible to test these on large scale. So um, what are the challenges here? So the, the, well, a big one, in addition to the one that I just listed, is that this is a specific case for, for a black box pipeline, is that in a typical current way of thinking about simulation, there are two separate stages. The first one is meshing. You take um, geometry in some format and you convert it to a mesh, which is usually a mesh of triangles or quads or tetrahedral or cubes. And this mesh needs to satisfy a lot of requirements to be good. And then there is a second step, which is uh, the actual uh, solve time, where you build bases on these elements and you solve your uh, partial differential equation. And these two steps are usually completely disjoint, where there is a set of criteria that the machine needs to satisfy, there is a set of criteria that the FT discretization expects, and the two communities very rarely talk with each other. So what we uh, argue here is that instead, this is the same problem. There is no point in generating a mesh if you cannot use it for simulation, and there is no point in doing simulation if you don't have a mesh before. And so what we are trying to do here is figuring out how to solve both of these challenges together at the same time. And we will see that doing this together dramatically simplifies um, both steps. So what our goals for uh, these uh, set of slides is to show you uh, our uh, efforts in going toward uh, what we call a black box analysis pipeline. That means that we can automate all of these and do it robustly with minimal assumption of the input. So we want a method that is fully automatic. It should have no or minimal requirements on the input, and we're going to be more precise on this later, and we want it to be predictable. So we want it to have a predictable error in the uh, simulation result in the end or at least controllable. So the idea here is to sort of try to redo things from scratch, but now thinking that we want things to run automatically on large collections and integrated. So in particular, our current take on this is that for now we are focusing on uh, robustness instead of runtime. It's okay if things take a long time to run, uh, but we want them to be robust. And the reason for this is that they enable automation. So for example, if you want to prepare a data set for um, learning how elastic objects deform, you probably need to generate millions of uh, simulation that you can use as samples for your learning algorithm. And you can run the million simulation in parallel on a big cluster. So it doesn't really matter what is the running time of one simulation, but what is important is that all the one million that you run are going to terminate and you're going to produce a result that you can actually trust. Um, and another common is that having perfect geometry, identical to what you provided in the beginning, it's not always something that you want. Um, and uh, finally, it's important to optimize at the same time meshing and finite element analysis. So um, what are we going to see uh, in, in this set is, first of all, what kind of uh, discretization do we want to use? So we need to partition our space in some way if we want to use a finite element method. So how do we do it? Do we want tetrahedra? Do we want cubes? Do we want splines? Do we want prisms or pyramids? 
So the first question is, which one of all these different options do we want and why? And in particular, the question is, uh, since all the different finite element methods should produce the same result under refinement, the right question to ask here, in our opinion, is which discretization will give you the lower running time for a fixed accuracy, right? So that you can get the same result, a result of a given accuracy that will depend on the application that you have, spending as less time as possible. And it's not, it's a less time as possible in the overall procedure, like including how long do you need to mesh, how long do you need to build your basis, how long do you need to solve. Uh, then the second step is, after you know what kind of elements you want, can you um, robustly and automatically create such a mesh with minimal assumption in the input? So tolerating things like small gaps and intersection or degenerate elements. Then, after you have a mesh, a natural question to answer is, well, do I need to have a good mesh? And what does it mean for a mesh to be good? And uh, is having a good mesh going to give me some advantages later on on the simulation? Um, and finally, after we know how to simulate, there are many other things to consider. One of them being, how do we handle collisions uh, between uh, objects? And how do we respond to, um, to contacts? So um, this is what we're going to cover in, in this video, but let me give you a very quick overview of um, all these, what, what's going to be the answer to these questions. So the first one is going to be a surprise, a surprise answer, and is that for most applications, um, at least for elliptic uh, and parabolic uh, PDEs, it seems that tetrahedra are a very good compromise. They, they give you good performances, and it's not, we couldn't find any case where actually going for cubes will give you a noticeably uh, major advantage. And tetrahedra also have a big uh, advantage of being much easier to, um, to use. So to, I mean, it's easier to create a mesh made of tetrahedra than one made of cube. And this gives us to a second point, which is, yes, we do have algorithms that allows us to create robustly um, tetrahedral mesh. Um, another surprise comes at the third point, where it's sort of well known that you want to have good elements and good quality. You don't want the tetrahedra to be completely squished. Otherwise, there are going to be problems in the simulation. But what uh, was surprising is that actually what you can do instead of fixing the mesh is to fix the solver, to make sure that the solver is able to give you a good result even if there are elements of low quality. And then finally, it's actually possible to do simulation with contacts with minimal parameter tuning. And uh, we are going to show uh, some uh, a method for doing this and some results in, uh, in this direction. Let me move to the first part of the talk in which I will explain to you uh, how we discover, how to uh, decide which uh, discretization provides the best running time for a given accuracy. So this seems kind of a simple problem and in fact there is an easy way to, to check that. So what we can do is just pick some elliptic PDE, something on the form of f which depends on the variable x, the unknown function u, the gradient and the second derivative of u, and we want that to be subject to some boundary conditions, some Dirichlet on one side and some Neumann. So Neumann are usually uh, used for uh, something like a force. And this kind of PDE seems completely abstract, but there are some uh, common simple physical uh, phenomena. One is elasticity, so how an elastic body deforms, and the other one is Poisson. Poisson is uh, the classical cotangent Laplace, and it's used for diffusion process. So if we have this PDE, what we can do is just try to solve many, many, many PDEs on different meshes, on different domains, uh, discretize both with tet and hexes, and try to discover which one is best, which one uh, it's faster with respect to a given error. So in the beginning I explained to you a little bit about a uh, finite element and now we are not doing it one in 1D but we are going to do, do it in 2D and 3D and for that we need to discretize our domain. So we discretize it before with a tiny segment and now we need to discretize it with either triangle or tetrahedra. And as in my uh, introductory on finite element we also can choose the order of the element. So, for example, we will uh, decide and uh, compare linear element, both tetrahedra and hexahedra, and quadratic, like uh, 
well in the tutorial we did cubic but here we just stick with quadratic there is no need to go so higher order and also we will pick a tetrahedra and a hexahedra and here I just want to set up some uh, terminology so for example a, a quadratic uh, hexahedron will be marked as q2 q for hexahedron and 2 for the quadratic and uh, for example a linear uh, tetrahedron will be marked as p1 so p for the tetrahedron and 1 for the linear so before going into uh, the, the comparison, I just want to give you a feeling on how this uh, meshes looks like. So a uh, hex mesh, a hexahedral mesh will look like nice regular grid in most of the part. This is something extremely difficult to create, but if the mesh, uh, if the meshing algorithm looks good, it's good. If the mesh will look good, the tetrahedral mesh will look more unstructured. But this is how the two meshes look like. So one of the simple experiments we can do is just try to see how this two uh, method behaves for a regular grid where creating a hex mesh is trivial. So what we did, we just created a long uh, bar, a cantilever bar, it's fixed on one side like in the picture and then we will apply some vertical force on uh, the opposite face. And what we can try to measure is the, defor uh, the formation at one of the uh, end point of the bar. And here from this picture we see that well the linear uh, tetrahedron in blue here they perform really really badly uh, the error is extremely uh, high at the very end something like 0 0.012 while uh, linear also uh, hexahedra are kind of okay and at the very end the quadratic element both tetrahedron and hexahedra are performing similarly on the bottom uh, violet and red but this is not really what we care about, so we now see that the error is kind of similar. What we really care about is uh, the timings. So from this plot we can see that uh, linear hexahedra are performing well, and from the initial slide from my introduction, the linear hexahedra are only 8 vertices uh, per element, while the uh, quadratic tetrahedra are 10. So maybe there is an uh, improvement. So what we can try to see is uh, compare the time versus error, which is what we really, really care at the end. And here we see that the uh, quadratic uh, tetrahedra have better uh, time versus error. So in fact, what you want to be is uh, on the bottom of this plot. The uh, linear hexahedra are still okay, but uh, not so good. And now before continuing, I just want to do a little parenthesis. Uh, some of you may have heard about isogeometric analysis, and the main idea of isogeometric analysis is to use a spline as basis function for the finite element space. So I show you in the tutorial we can use this interpolatory at Lagrange basis where they are one on top of one node and zero everywhere else. Well, this is just a standard choice. One could also use something else, like for example a spline. The advantage of spline is that we will have a fixed number of degree of freedom per element. So even quadratic spline will have one node per element more. The disadvantage is that since the spline of this extended smoothness, the sparsity of the matrix will be larger. And another big disadvantage of spline is extremely difficult to create a spline basis on a grid, on an irregular grid. So this works well for this banded bars, but it's really difficult to deploy in the world. So let me show you the performance. So the performance on these perfect hex meshes for spline is also not great. It's similar to uh, the quadratic tetrahedron. So from this simple experiment, we can already see that while there is no much difference between Q and P for the quadratic, so no much difference between hexahedra and tetrahedra for quadratic element, but since uh, tetrahedra are easier to create, uh, at the very end it will be better. So this is not only true for this simple bar, it's also true for uh, extremely uh, near to be incompressible material so if you know a little bit about physics the moment something becomes incompressible you have some uh, things that goes to infinity in the uh, in the pdes you have a concept which goes to infinity so there is a common way which is some kind of lagrange multiplier like so you introduce some pressure and you can use something that's called mixed elements so you have two discretization one for the pressure and one for the uh, displacement and this kind of fix this uh, problem of infinity so here we see again the quadratic triangle in this case are really good so these are the triangle the quadratic triangle are really good comparable with the mixed discretization and the linear uh, triangle are really really bad the uh, solution looks something completely random what's interesting to note here for the uh, uh, quads the linear quads, the solution looks good. I mean, if you just look at the plot, you would say this is a correct solution. But in fact, it's completely off and completely different from the real one. And again, the quadratic at quads and uh, mixed quads also have a similar performance. 
So we'll study the experiment with nonlinear material model, and here we are uh, showing uh, the result for uh, the four discretization. And again, apart from the linear uh, tetrahedra, the other three are uh, nearly indistinguishable. So one important difference here is the runtime. So the linear uh, triangular extremely fast is then more, it takes more or less 10 seconds to solve. Uh, the quadratic uh, tetrahedra also are around one minute, and the quadratic hexahedra are out of scale. So this is just a visual comparison. What we can do is uh, we can look at the uh, uh, actual uh, uh, value. So here what I'm plotting is uh, the uh, deviation from a linear uh, rotation in the angle across the section of the bar. So every bar here I'm sampling the displacement and computing the uh, rotation angle and plotting the deviation from the rotation angle uh, here. And we see again in this plot that the uh, P1 as expected, so the linear tetrahedra are not really not good. We see it also from, uh, the, uh, from the plot, while the uh, other discretization are more or less overlapping. And here from this kind of plot, we also that the orange one is not so good with respect to the other two. The other the two are completely overlapped. What we can do to try to fix this problem is that creating a denser mesh. So now they're really looking distinguishable. There is some steel artifact on the linear uh, tetrahedron, but the training time here goes completely out of scale. So the Q2 elements now take uh, something like 31 hours, so more than one day. And if we plot the angle deviation, we see again the linear uh, tetrahedron are not really good. They have this all this jaggery, all the other lines are superposed. So these experiments are nice and good, but they're kind of just showing something anecdotal. So we should show some uh, different material model, different uh, discretization, but on some a few experiments. So if you want to actually get some statistically relevant uh, data, what we need to do is just come up with a large data set and try to test all this discretization with a different PD. So we just collected two data sets. The first one is the Hexalab. So Hexalab is really nice project. Uh, developed by some researcher in Italy, and it contains a collection of uh, state-of-the-art X meshes. So they, co they collected something like 16 different uh, state-of-the-art papers, and overall it contains something like almost uh, 240 meshes. And let me comment on the flip uh, later on. So this is the state-of-the-art data set. We also uh, use MeshM, which is a commercial software uh, which is able to uh, create uh, hexahedral meshes. And for the uh, mesh M, we just downloaded 3200 meshes from the common Thinkit10K dataset. So let me comment on the flips. So uh, when you're solving uh, a finite element simulation, what you need is all your elements to have positive volume. You can think about that if an element has negative volume, it will not be physical and the solution will not be, and the PD will not make any sense. So what's uh, interesting to note is that all these methods, they guarantee to produce uh, valid uh, hex meshes, so positive volume hex meshes, but in fact they don't, so there is some uh, problem in these methods. And let me final, uh, add a final comment about this flipped element. If you ever try to do uh, triangle meshing, there is this check of uh, is the triangle flip or not, and this is exactly why it's coming from. So this is how we obtain our hex meshing meshes, and uh, well, we created for every hex mesh, we generate a tetrahedral mesh with a that while, which we presented later in this talk, with the same number of vertices. So now we have meshes which have similar number of vertices. So now with this large data set we can actually compute and solve PD and see how the two methods are behaving. So let me start first with the hexalab. So these are really state-of-the-art max mesh X meshes almost done by hand. And this is the result for the Laplace equation and this is really difficult to distinguish but I can draw some uh, ellipses on top of it and we see there is kind of a distinction between the linear and the quadratic element, but there is no clear distinction between the blue tone and the red tone. There is no really distinction between Q and, uh, a and H. So, so between uh, P and Q, sorry. And uh, this is the same exactly for the uh, elasticity example. So here we have some linear and quadratic element. Again, they're kind of separated. The linear is performing uh, less good, while the quadratic are performing better. But again, there is no clear distinction between violet and uh, red dots. And again, these plots are just showing error versus time. 
So these are the perfect uh, meshes. So even for perfect meshes, there is no uh, much difference. And let me show you also the result for the layer data set for the thinking and K data set. So this is the Laplace. Here there is no need of ellipses. We clearly see two separated cloud on top, the linear one, which have, uh, they are faster, but they have a higher error. Then on the bottom, uh, there is the quadratic elements, which are a slower but lower error. And again, we see the two clouds are completely overlapped. There is no clear distinction between violet and, and red, so there is no much advantage of uh, hexahedral meshes. And more or less the same plot can be done uh, for elasticity. Everything is kind of overlapped. And now, before, before concluding this part of the talk, I just want to, uh, again, do a little parenthesis. So for X meshes, there has been some uh, research in something that's called a serendipity element. So a serendipity element is an element which has something almost like a quadratic, uh, it looks like a quadratic element, but it has a little bit less known to be a little bit more efficient. So if you think about a hexahedral element of this tensor product structure, so at the very end your polynomial will be higher order. For example, a Q1 element will be uh, linear on the three direction, overall it will be three linear and have this uh, at being this cubic polynomial. The serendipity element, they are kind of trying to reformulate the element to still be linear on the three direction but not contain this uh, cubic polynomial in the middle. So you can create this serendipity element, for example, for uh, instead of Q2. And this is showing exactly that. So you see they're a little bit faster here in yellow than uh, Q2 because they have less degree of freedom, but they also introduce higher error. So even if you try to compare with this serendipity element, there is no much advantage with respect uh, to P2. So let me summarize here a little bit. So we show here that P2, so the quadratic hexahedra is superior or almost comparable to P2. It's definitely superior to P1. So P1 is really bad, it has this uh, weird artifact. So Q2 is better than Q1, of course, and Q1 is better than P1. So the bottom line here is that quadratic element, uh, quadratic tetrahedral element are good, linear uh, tetrahedral element are bad. And now I show you also some uh, comparison with serendipity element. This was similar performance as quadratic element, a little bit worse error, but a little bit faster. And then something I didn't show also because we have only preliminary result is uh, the comparison with something with pH, which is a polyhedral element. So when you create a, a hex mesh, it's really, really difficult to have cubes everywhere. So one question would be, can we leave some uh, polyhedron now and there and can we uh, and what about the performance so uh, our preliminary experiment showed that this polyhedral element performed similarly to Q2 meaning at the very end that P2 is better so which is better than and then while well, we did this uh, preliminary result with spline spline is slightly better for that simple experiment we have than P2 it's really difficult to compare them uh, more in the wild because it's difficult to generate this uh, basis for uh, generic hex meshes so this remains an open question so this is the, the whole summary. So if you can use plan, well, it's probably a good idea, but in general, it's really difficult. And since uh, tetrahedral uh, meshes are way easier to create, uh, the best element here would be uh, P2. So the result I show are uh, just partial. If you're curious about uh, this plot and you want to compare more dimensions, so I just show time versus error, the whole data is uh, online, so there is this uh, the results are on this URL, and we also have an interactive plot also linked from this URL where you can uh, freely change it to axis to compare different dimensions and to see which elements um, is better. So before concluding, let me uh, uh, tell you a little bit about limitation about this study. So we kind of focus only on elliptic PDE, so we only show, for example, mechanics, so Laplace and elasticity. We have no result for something like fluids. This is something we are working on uh, now. Another important question is what about uh, time integration? Does it affect, uh, do the different method have different CFL condition? Do they require different uh, time stepping methods? This is still an open question. This is something we are uh, working on now. I show you some example of this serendipity element, which is a common trick to try to make uh, hexahedral element faster is still an open question. There are other tricks, other tricks also with respect to the quadrature, something called like uh, reduced quadrature or hourglass control. This is something we haven't explored uh, deeply. Uh, 
I just want to comment on that. If we start playing with the quadrature, the only thing we'll make faster is the assembly. And in all the simulation, all our experience is normally the solve time, which is uh, uh, dominating everything. So even if you make the assembly faster, uh, the actual solve time will remain more or less the same, and you actually will damage the quality of the solution. And finally, for the large scale, uh, experiment we only run with fabricated solution which is kind of something uh, artificial this is not real uh, experiment so for fabricated solution what we do you start from a, a known function and then you just plug inside the PDE to get the binary condition on the right hand side it's really difficult to come up with real physical experiment on thousands of nodes now that we saw that a good choice for discretization is to use tetrahedral meshes the next question is can we generate them robustly without making assumptions on the input. And first, let's take a look at why meshing is so hard. So this is a CAD model uh, with, uh, that has been converted to a triangle mesh using an existing uh, geometric kernel. And as you can see here, the triangulation looks very uneven. Now let's zoom in on that um, red circle and you can see that there are a lot of local problems, a lot of set intersection, bad triangles, and these are problematics for certain measures, especially if you try to decide what is inside and what is outside, since there are certain intersection, it's very hard to tell. But let's look at another point. This also doesn't look great. And uh, in particular, there is actually one region in the back. It's a connection between two patches. And if you zoom in in there, you actually find that there are a lot of certain intersections there. Uh, while we don't know exactly where this model was coming from, it was part of a thing if and k, what it's likely that happened here is that the tolerance that is used to stitch together two patches that are close by was somehow different between the program that was to generate the mesh and to convert to a triangle mesh, or something went wrong in the mesher. But it doesn't matter what the reason is, this is the input that we got. And while it looks fine from a distance, it's something that existing tetrahedralization methods don't want to process because indeed it's invalid it does not contain uh, it does not enclose uh, volume um, on the other hand we would like to be able to use it if that's what we have so but why is it so difficult to represent 3d geometry and the main problem is that there are many different ways of doing it you can use implicit function you can use meshes and um, you can use a manifold atlas and even if you pick a representation like meshes, for the same surface, you can have many different kinds of meshes. So differently from images, there is not a clear way on how to represent surfaces. Uh, another thing is that many of the operations that are usually done when you deal with 3D geometry are not close under the representation that you use. A simple case is if you just start on a plane and you compute the intersection between two segments, the intersection point is not going to lie on any of the two segments if you use floating point, just because there is rounding happening. And so what do you do? I mean, you, you have to do operations and your representation, your points are in floating point. So how do you do it? And here you really have two choices. One is you ignore the fact that this happens and you just consider, ignore the fact that the operation are gonna introduce errors. And this will result in algorithms that are not robust, that people probably have parameters that you need to tune. And if they are wrong, it just the argument will break. The other option is that you do handle it. And if you do that, is your algorithm is going to just become more complex. And the more complex it is, the more likely it is that you have bugs uh, in, in there. Um, so it's something that needs to be done uh, carefully. And one way of doing it is to actually test your algorithm on large collection of data to make sure that at least on this large collection of data, everything is fine. Um, and so this is what I showed you um, before. Uh, we, if you take these and you test existing tetralization method on this input, this is what you're going to get. Some of this is due to input invalid. Some of this is due to the fact that the algorithm crashed because there are problems in how um, operations are done inside. Or maybe just implementation uh, bugs in the algorithm. Um, so what we propose, it's very different from what existing methods do. So instead of having our statement as, I give you a boundary and I want to fill the interior with tetrahedra, we're doing something different. We're going to give you some input that in this case is completely unstructured. It's just a collection of segments. I'm making an example in 2D just to make the explanation more clear. Um, and then our goal will be to, initially, we're going to build some envelope. Um, I can think of it as a shell around uh, the input segments. And then what we want is now to reconstruct a 
um, a mesh that passes, that stays inside this envelope. So our idea is that instead of trying to exactly reproduce what we have as input, we want something that is close. And this definition of close is something that the user can control. So you can decide uh, what kind of error are you willing to tolerate. And so now this at, at, at the first look might seem weird, like wh why would I want to destroy my geometry? This is my input, I want to be as accurate as possible. But the reason why you might want to do it is because, for example, if you have two things that are very, very close together, or a triangle that is almost degenerate, if you try to keep that degenerate triangle in your output, you're never going to be able to get a good mesh. On the other hand, if you think of it as a uh, more in an application-driven way, where, for example, your object might be used later on for doing I don't know, CNC milling, it's really pointless to represent in your geometry features that are much smaller than the tolerance of your machine. I mean, anyway, you will not be able to represent these when you generate instructions that you have to send to, to your machine. So the idea here now is that we are going to do the operation that we want to do, in this case, meshing, but up to a certain tolerance that is under the control uh, of the user. So our new take on tetrahedral meshing um, is the following. We start from the input. We do a set of operations that are uh, trying to simplify the mesh as much as possible to reduce the number of triangles while uh, satisfying uh, the geometric tolerance that we prescribed. Then we are going to generate a volumetric mesh just uniformly with a uh, grid over the entire space. And then, one at a time, we are going to insert these triangles as faces inside the tetrahedral mesh. And this operation is, is an operation that if you do in floating point, will fail, because there are going to be numerical problems, there are potentially tetrahedra that have uh, zero area or even flipped. Um, and so what we do instead is we postpone. Every time we cannot insert a triangle, we don't do it for now. Then we are going to do local operations to try to make the quality of the tetrahedral mesh better. And then after this is done, we're going to try to insert more triangles. So this procedure is uh, guaranteed to stop at some point. I mean, we either insert all the triangles or we cannot insert some of the triangles. Um, but in practice, we are always able to insert this triangle, except in extreme cases where we are trying to really insert sliver triangles that, uh, that cannot be inserted due to uh, floating point uh, problems. So after this is done, we remove all the tetrahedra that are not um, inside uh, the volume, and we keep the one inside. So this is the entire uh, idea. And so the key part here is that the algorithm produces a box of completely filled with tetrahedra, and the tetrahedra have faces that are close to the input triangles. So this is what we do. And this final filtering to decide what is inside and what, and what is outside is a heuristic step, but is not really needed for every for every application. It depends. It's something that it's down the application dependent. I mean, of course, this filtering it's easy if your mesh is clean, but in our case, the focus is to also being able to do it for meshes that are not clean. Um, so if you do it in this way, our success rate is one hundred percent. And um, what it's uh, exciting is that. Despite the increased robustness, our method is in speed comparable to other implementations. It's actually um, faster than Seagull and uh, slightly faster uh, than Tetchin. And so in this way, you get robustness. You also have reasonable running time. What you pay is that you might have some errors, uh, geometric errors with respect to the input. Um, so this is something that on every application is going to be different. I think for most practical applications, especially the one that are targeting simulation for then feeding back the object to the real world and fabricate them, it's very reasonable to have some tolerance that is comparable to the machining tolerance. Since anyway, uh, you will not be able, when you fabricate the object, to have something that is more accurate than that. Um, what you gain is that now you can provide to the measure uh, more or less whatever you like. You just need to provide the triangle soup. So this is an example of a mesh with uh, many horrible triangles in the bottom and on the left. And what you see that is on the right, it gets cleaned up and you get a very nice tetrahedral mesh out of it. And if you only care about the surface mesh, you can also just 
take out the boundary of a tetrahedral mesh and use it as a surface mesh. Uh, this is the bridge, uh, the, um, uh, the part of a clock uh, that I showed you before. And um, here you can see that the, um, the triangles get cleaned up. And what you get in the end is a mesh that is much coarser than what you had uh, as, um, as input and clean, like all these nasty collection of set intersections are uh, resolved. It, for this specific model, it takes a while. So as a rule of thumb, like models that have more problems takes longer to be meshed, but still in one hour, fully automatically, without any user interaction, you get a clean model out of it. Um, this is um, an example of what uh, this technology allows you to do. This is an example on the left of a, a collection of cylinders. This is a pillar. And um, this model was generated by simply putting together all the cylinders without really caring about how they join together. And then our method was used to, at the same time, clean up all the self intersections and give you a good tetrahedral mesh. And so here you can really go from a quick script that generates a geometry and then feed it to our method to get a mesh that can be directly used for simulation. Um, the parameters that you really need to pick is the envelope, like the tolerance, the geometric tolerance that you allow it um, to deviate from the, from the input. Um, and here, the limitation of the algorithm is that the smaller is the geometric tolerance, the denser is gonna be the output mesh, and the slower the algorithm is gonna be. Um, so especially for the small envelopes, this difference might make a big difference. Um, a side effect, a positive side effect of our algorithm is that we can um, use this method not only to generate tetrahedral meshes, but also to clean existing meshes. So in this case, we have a mesh on the left. Uh, the one in the middle is an example of another software that is used to just clean up the surface. What you see on the right is an example where our method was used to create a tap mesh of the, the input, and then we throw away the tetrahedra and we only kept the surface. And what you see here is that the mesh is clean, it has good quality, and it can now be used in downstream tasks. So this procedure can also be used not only to generate tetrahedral meshes, but also to clean triangle mesh. Um, you can use this to do Boolean operations. The idea here is that you can take as many uh, meshes as you like, you put them all together, you mesh the entire box that contains them, and then you decide which tetrahedra to keep using some rules that depends on your uh, tree of operations that you want to perform. And uh, this is a way that this is a method that allows you to do Boolean operation while at the same time generating a mesh that is immediately um, usable in uh, downstream applications. Um, well, the meshes can be used directly for simulation as uh, you're gonna see uh, later in, uh, in this presentation. And uh, in particular, this idea of being able to take meshes, do Boolean and directly simulate allows you to very quickly have uh, those complex simulations like this one here, where you have a, a tube, you have a complex object, you put them together, you mesh the space in between by doing a, a Boolean operation, a Boolean subtraction, and then the mesh is ready and can be directly fed to an FEM solver for, in this case, simulating a flow uh, of um, a liquid passing through the tube. So what are the limitations of this approach? Well, one limitation is that what we are really doing is mesh an entire box around the object. And then we need to decide which tetrahedra are inside and which one are outside. So if a mesh is clean, this is easy and there is nothing to discuss. But if it's not, then we need to somehow decide which one. And we have different strategies for doing this. One is the winding number, another one is flood filling. But at that stage, if a mesh is not clean, we need to use some heuristic to decide what might be inside and what might not be. So while this heuristic works pretty well on average, it's possible to produce uh, corner cases where the heuristics like drop some components uh, or uh, delete some, um, some part of the input that we expect to, to be there. Especially like if the input contains shells that don't actually enclose a volume like open shells, then there is really um, no way we can know what is inside and what is outside. It's really uh, undefined. And so the algorithm is going to keep or throw away parts that uh, we might not expect. Um, before we move on to the next topic, I also would like to briefly cover curved meshing. So up to now, all the meshes we had always had straight edges. But this doesn't need to be. 
and you could or you can also use meshes that have curved boundaries curved edges so what what does it mean well you, you have a in this case you have a triangle mesh and some of the edges of this triangle mesh can be curved uh, so it can be polynomials of order higher than uh, one and what you get by doing this is that you can approximate the same you can represent the same geometry using a smaller number of elements and it turns out that the cost of the simulation depends mostly on the number of elements and actually going to to curve meshes it's a small uh, cost um, and so what you do here what you can do if you have curved meshes is you can use a coarser mesh to still get uh, the same quality and so you get in the end faster simulations but not only this so the fact that you can use curved meshes means that you can actually reproduce um, existing curves exactly for example in this case you have an SVG and uh, if a degree of the curves inside the SVG is, uh, is limited, you can reproduce this exactly using quadratic or cubic uh, curves. So you might actually get a mesh, which is a discretization of the space, which is exactly reproducing your boundary. And this will give you a more accurate simulation in the end. I mean, if you use piecewise linear elements to approximate something that is not piecewise linear, you're always going to have an error. The error is going to go down if you refine, but it's never going to be exactly zero. While with curved meshes, you have a chance of actually reducing it to zero. Um, so we have a similar pipeline to what I uh, presented before for dealing with curved 2D triangulation. So here the input is a set of input curves. We do an initial cleanup to make sure that the curves are not too close. If the curves are too close, like numerically close, it's impossible to have good quality. So we need to do some uh, cleanup of the input to ensure that they are all separated by some tolerance. Um, and then we can use a, a pipeline similar to the one that I presented for tetrahedral meshes to create a background mesh made of triangles. In this case, similar to before, we are meshing an entire box around uh, our object. Then after this is done, we can improve the quality. And after the quality is improved, we can curve the elements to match the input curves. And here, the important part of this algorithm is that we need to um, create the linear mesh already thinking about the curving that is going to happen later. Otherwise, the curving might not be possible. Our idea for this algorithm is that we're going to try to do our best to curve without breaking the mesh. So we only curve if we don't make the geometric map having a negative uh, Jacobian. So in, in this way, uh, we can always guarantee to produce a valid mesh, but the downside is that we might lose some uh, do some small error in reproducing the input curves. So in practice, this argument works really well. We tested on a collection of SVGs, and you can see here that even for very complex geometries, we can uh, get uh, a mesh with these features in. These are examples of self-intersecting curves. And uh, if you want to see more, we actually run these on a collection from Open Clipart. We got 20,000 SVGs from there, and we just run it on uh, all of them and we got a valid uh, mesh for all these cases. Um, success both in the tetrahedral meshing and in this case means that within a certain time it uh, terminated creating a valid mesh with no inverted elements. Um, what can you do with this? So you can uh, for example do diffusion curves which is a technique that was introduced, introduced by Adobe a few years ago. The idea being that you have a drawing and you have color assigned on the two sides of the curve and then you diffuse it solving an harmonic problem and here the advantage is that as you can see here uh, flickering between the two in this case the two meshes have the same number of elements so the cost is almost the same the difference in runtime is around two three percent but you can see clearly that one result is much better than the other because you don't see the linear edges so here you are essentially paying in a little bit more complex algorithm to create the mesh to get a result at runtime which is much better for a tiny, uh, tiny performance of rep. So I think this is an exciting uh, direction. Um, another example, this is a, a, um, a fluid simulation. You have this uh, square filled with, like a cut with uh, small holes with this array of holes and you have a flow passing through. Uh, here is what you get with a curved mesh. Uh, and now we are going to look at the same result with a linear mesh at the same resolution. So note how here all these lines are very nice, smooth, and symmetric, 
As soon as we switch to the linear mesh, you can immediately see that the symmetry is broken, the circle don't look like circle anymore, and uh, the result that you get is clearly different. So again, if you can mesh with curved meshes, you get a better result for more or less the same cost. Um, this is an example of elasticity, and here we are comparing a coarse curved mesh against a dense linear mesh. And what you can see here is that they are indistinguishable at, uh, in, in this scenario. They are almost the same. Um, the big thing is the difference in timing. There are like multiple order of magnitude of difference in what we had to do for the one on the right and what we had to do for the one in the middle. Um, so there are many limitations in our implementation of this measure. So for now, we only support cubic Bezier in curves in 2D. We can only do isotropic meshing, and uh, we cannot guarantee that all the features that you provide are going to be preserved. So there can be like small parts that are not preserved. Um, extending this method to 3D is highly non-trivial, and this is one of the uh, things that we are uh, one of the big problems, big challenges that we are trying to uh, solve. We know we can generate tetrahedral mesh uh, meshes robustly. The big question is, do we need to create perfect meshes with perfectly regular elements, or can we run simulation even on imperfect, imperfect meshes with some elements which are really bad? So this is uh, what I will try to explain you in this part of the talk. So before going there, the big question is, does it really matter? Do we really need to have these perfect meshes or can we run simulation uh, or the simulation is really not affected? So for doing that, I will just pick a super, super simple PD, which is the Laplacian of u equal f with f equal to alpha x squared. And for this simple PD, uh, the solution is just u equal x to the 4, which is just this glorified parabola plotted here. So now if you want to uh, solve this PD with finite element, what we need, we need to create a mesh. In this simple case, the uh, domain is just a uh, unit square, so to create a mesh, we can just create this beautifully regular uh, mesh with all right angle triangles. So now we can run finite element and see how the solution looks like. And this is how the solution looks like. You may think that this is, in fact, a bad solution because he has these uh, kings a little bit everywhere. But in fact, this is a really, really good solution, and the kings cr comes from the fact that the mesh is really, really coarse. But I would say this solution looks similar to the other one, and everything is fine. So now if we want to uh, observe or study the effect of the quality of the mesh on the solution, what we can do is there in the middle in this uh, strip, we can start putting more and more bad elements. So this bed element will be a tiny, long, elongated triangle, and we have more and more uh, strip of them. And you see, as we are adding them, there is something ha happening and appearing in the middle of this solution. And if I continue to add them, you see, start uh, lifting. And the more and the more we add, at the very end, the uh, uh, mesh doesn't look at all like the initial one. And I here want just to stress the fact that there is no numerical problem for solving this uh, PDE with just using a linear system, and the linear system is solved with a, a direct solver, so there is no numerical error. And the size of the triangle there in the middle, if, even if they are not visible anymore in the close-up, is they are still reasonably large to not create any uh, numerical problem. So the bridge appearing here, or this completely weird artifact, is completely due to the fact that the uh, quality of the mesh is bad. You can think about that this triangle here in the middle, they cannot bend over there, they're stiff and straight, so this will. Uh, this is why it's creating the bridge. So one thing, if you are doing matching, you can think, well, that's, uh, who cares, let's try to uh, rematch this match. So in that previous case, we can actually, we can try to smooth and move stuff around. This is in fact an expensive process, but let's think about, can we always do it? And in fact, for this kind of thin, long future, we can, and in fact the remeshing will make everything even worse. So let me try to give you uh, the feeling of why this, uh, this, uh, this remeshing cannot be applied for this kind of meshes. So you see that feature, this long elongated feature creates problems. So let me show you in 1D. So this is the uh, tiny elongated feature, so let's try to create one big triangle there. And you can think about that this triangle is kind of baddish because it has this uh, acute uh, corner. And if we try to re, uh, to refine it and to remesh it, you see what's happening. The acute corner will become uh, more and more acute, and in the limit it will become a line. So remeshing here is really, really not an option. We are even making things worse. So how can you actually compensate for the bad quality of the element without doing remesh? So our idea is to locally increase the order of the element to compensate. So I show you in the very 
<coughs> in the tutorial about finite element that we can have a linear or cubic element and when we compare uh, to the tetrahedra and hexahedra I show linear and quadratic element and all the meshes there were all linear and all quadratic what we can do is start mixing elements so we can have linear element where the quality of the element is good and we can have uh, quartic or cubic element where the quality is bad and you can see from this picture here that uh, the good element, the one that looked like a regular triangle, the old yellow, remaining linear, and the bad one, like next to the neck of this uh, frog-like uh, animal, they start being quartic with really, really high degree. And in between, there's some kind of uh, quadratic and cubic element. And I just want to point out that this uh, idea of increasing the order of an element is uh, something that's in finite elements quite common, and it's uh, something that's called a refinement. And in fact, there are two kinds of refinement, the more classical one, which is H refinement, uh, where the idea is to increase the resolution of the mesh locally. And this has been widely uh, expo exploited in graphic, for example, for uh, cloth simulation or cracks. And it's important to notice that this age refinement is usually done a posteriori in the sense that we first solve the PDE, have some heuristic to decide where there is too much error, and then refine the mesh. The other kind of refinement is still a posteriori, is something that's called P-refinement, which is more similar to what we are doing, and this is also something dating back the uh, original finite element with Babushka, for example. And again, this is a posteriori, so you first solve the PDE and then have some heuristic and decide where to increase the order of the element to uh, compensate for the uh, bad solution. What we do instead is kind of similar but completely orthogonal because what we do is a priori, we only increase the order based on the input. So we don't care about what is the solution, we only increase the order of the uh, element to compensate for bad geometry, for bad input. We never solve it twice. And I just want to point out that our technique is, can be completely combined with the other two. So you can solve with our method and then use some heuristic for a posteriori P refinement or use some polaristic to refine the mesh uh, with age refinement. So how actually we can decide where and how to refine a priori. So to do that we have a, a simple formula that looks scary. So let me explain you uh, this magic formula. So this magic formula, what it does, it relates uh, the order uh, k of an element, uh, this is what we want to assign. And this relates to other quantities, for example, a user control parameter, a tolerance, uh, this b in all our experiments just used uh, 3. So this is just giving us uh, a little bit of tolerance. And then, well, we have the average ledge length of the mesh, this is something super simple to compute. We got the minimum order, so what is the usual order you want to solve? usually it's one and then we have some constant which are related to the shape of a perfect element in 2d and 3d so this is square root of 3 divided by 6 so square root of 6 divided by 12 this is just a constant and then finally some local quantity related to the current element so we got h e which is the uh, maximum edge length and then we have uh, sigma e which is the ratio between the uh, radius of the inscribed uh, circle and the maximum edge length so I just want to point out that this, all these quantities are really, really simple quantity to compute. They only depend on the local order. So again, if you give me a triangle or a tetrahedron, we can easily compute this sigma and h, uh, sigma and h using some geometric quantity like the volume or the surface of an element. So give me an element and I can give you immediately k and it's extremely easy. There is no complicated computation here to be done. Once we have k for every element, what we need to do is to assign it to every uh, element of the mesh. And what we need to do is we need to iterate with a simple loop over the element and compute k e uh, using the formula. So we need to just compute k uh, for every element. And now the formula is telling us, well, we want that element to be degree 3 or degree 2. And the problem is, if our degree element, for example, degree 3 element will be next to a degree 1 element, well, it will lose some degree of freedom because uh, of the next uh, of the element next to it. So what we need to do is just uh, increase the order of the element E and every uh, face or edge into the uh, neighbor. So if you want the element uh, E here to be P3 in pink, well, we need to increase the order of the three uh, edge neighbors uh, of E also to uh, to train. So now E is full uh, degree uh, order three. And if we do something like that, this is how our uh, mesh looks like. So this is really simple. Just loop over the element, select, uh, 
at the degree using the previous formula and just use the navigation of the mesh to compute the degree. Now uh, we have this mesh, we have some linear and cubic elements next to each other and uh, on one of the basic requirements in finite elements have a continuous basis, C0 basis and now we end up having a linear and a cubic element and of course will not match on the interface. So uh, what can we do? So this is a simple example, we have a linear element in yellow and a cubic element in pink and if we want them to be continuous, well what we want is on the blue line here in the middle we want the basis to be linear. So the linear basis will be linear but the cubic will not. And uh, the, the trick here behind that is we can think about a linear uh, function as a special case of a cubic function with two special coefficients, zero for the uh, quadratic and the cubic term. So the only thing we need to do is to constrain the nodes of the cubic element, the one we have to match, uh, to some uh, constant to ensure that the basis uh, is linear and thus killing these higher order terms. And there is a really, really simple way, for example, if we just uh, change this uh, weight to two-thirds and one-third and add them as a contribution to the linear basis on the corner. And in fact, if we do that, we just obtain this uh, nice um, basis, which is cubic on one side, as you see, it's not, and then it's nicely meeting uh, the linear basis on the other side and being linear in the middle. So, this is how you construct the C0 basis. This may seem a little bit technical. What you need to do is to change the local to global mapping. But I just want to stress out, if you have a finite element code that already supports a posteriori refinement, the only thing you need to do is just use the existing machinery with uh, our formula. So this is something quite standard in finite element. So now that we have final uh, C0 basis, the only thing you need to do is just set up and use this basis for your simulation. So let me go back to the initial example with the Laplace. And on one side, I'm showing you the standard finite element. On the other side, I'm showing uh, our result. And well, in the beginning, uh, the mesh is good, so our method still doesn't do anything and keeps the element linear. The moment we start having bad and worse and worse quality, well, you see some pink appearing and our method will automatically uh, increase the order of the element. And here we kind of see the price to pay uh, to compensate for this bit quality. We have some higher order element and it takes a little bit more time, something like three times more. And if we destroy the quality of the mesh even worse, well, the color of the element will become uh, darker and darker pink. So here we have some cubic element. The solution still looks uh, perfectly good. And here is the price we have to pay. It takes something like uh, 10 times more uh, to solve. This is not such a big deal, but it takes a little bit longer, but there is no parameter tuning. Everything here is completely automatic and the quality of the solution remains good. So this is of course true not only for uh, the Laplace, it's also true for nonlinear equations. So on top I have uh, 2D and the bottom I have 2D. On one side I have the standard, so normal linear element. On the other side I have our solution. And we do the same experiment. We introduce more and more bad element and you see uh, how the solution looks like. So for ours it doesn't move much. For, for the uh, standard element the solution moves a lot and uh, at the very end it looks completely different from the initial. So as for all our, uh, our other work, uh, we are not only satisfied on testing it on one uh, model, on some uh, model, what we did, we just took this thing in k data set and generated two data sets. Since we want to study what is the, how our method is behaving for uh, bad meshes, we run the tetrahedral mesh that completely and fully optimized to the very end to get the best possible quality and we also run it uh, for the non-optimized so we just stop the optimization as soon as possible. So before showing you the result on this layer data set um, there is a question how we actually measure uh, the error so this is the standard L2 estimate for finite elements so this is just showing us uh, the L2 norm of the error and what it does is just compute uh, this uh, norm between the actual real solution and uh, the approximated solution and so the exact solution is what we had in the very beginning this is how it looks like this is our approximated solution and the big problem here is that this uh, estimate will have this edge square in it so we'll have a different age for every model since the model of different scale different resolution so if you just try to compare this error it doesn't really uh, it's not really similar we'll have a different age for everyone
So what we uh, come up with is a different measure to kind of remove that, something we call L2 efficiency. So we just take this uh, L2 norm of the error and just dividing it by uh, H square. So this is kind of giving us the constant C, which is what we were targeting for. And just want to point out that here having small value is something good. So let me show you the result. So in uh, green is our method and in uh, yellow is the P1. And you see that the efficiency for our method is low, meaning it's good for both fully optimized and non-optimized data set. So our method automatically compensates for the bad quality of the element having really, really, really uh, low efficiency, which is extremely good. Of course, the price we are paying here is we are uh, sneaking in more higher order element. So, for example, for the fully optimized data set, since uh, the meshes are good, we mostly have linear element with 73% P1. And of course, the mesher can not always, always create, generate a perfect element. Sometimes it will just uh, be impossible because uh, elements next to the boundary are difficult to optimize. So there will be something like one quarter of quadratic element. If we run our method on the uh, non-optimized data set, while well, we end up having way more quadratic element, less linear element, most of the elements are bad, so we need to compensate for the bad quality. And there are also uh, quadratic, sorry, cubic and quartic elements sneaking in. There are 10% of uh, cubic element and 1% of quartic element. And this is exactly what we are paying the price. So we have more higher order element, and thus we have more uh, a larger number of degree of freedom. So this is the ratio of the increase on degree of freedom. So for the fully optimized data set, we have more or less twice the number of degree of freedom of non-standard uh, finite element. For the not optimized, we have a much larger curve and we have something like six times more degree of freedom than the standard finite element. So this will give us a uh, higher running time. But again, this is fully automatic and you don't need to care about having good meshes. This will automatically compensate for the bad meshes. So I just want to show you some uh, timings. So we see that our method is kind of uh, a little bit slower and for the non-optimized uh, meshes it's even uh, a little bit uh, slower. But again, this is fully automatic and there is nothing to be done. This is a small price to pay. I also want to notice that the optimization of the mesh is something complicated to do. So if we, uh, we are slower in some time, but in fact the meshing will be uh, so before concluding, let me give you some uh, limitation explain to you to conclude this, this work. So first, again, we study only elliptic and static PDEs. Uh, the analysis or the formula is more complicated for uh, dynamic simulation and for non-elliptic PDE. Uh, another thing, we just compensate for the bad quality. We have no uh, actual control on the actual error because the error at the very end depends also on the L2 norm of the solution which we don't know so we need to mix our method with some a posteriori refinement and there is something to be said about having higher order element it kind of degrades and makes the condition number of the uh, system uh, a little bit worse which kind of influence uh, the timing for uh, linear uh, iterative solver this is not something we we saw uh, in our experiment at the very end the condition number was still limited but it could uh, affect the performance of the uh, solver in the last part of this tutorial, I want to explain to you how we can actually uh, automatically simulate the collision between soft objects uh, in a completely black box manner. So no parameter tuning, everything is perfect. So we started from deciding which discretization we want to use, uh, then we show how to actually generate mesh robustly, we show that we can actually compensate for bad quality, and finally the big question is can we uh, upscale it to more complicated simulation. So uh, this is based on a, a recent paper which was published at SIGGRAPH and this is called incremental, po uh, incremental Potential Content, ICP. And the whole goal here is to run uh, simulation robustly. So in the very beginning we show you this state-of-the-art uh, simulation software and for this super simple simulation where we are just two square uh, colliding to each other there were massive failure if you had the wrong parameter in. And this is true not only for uh, state-of-the-art software, but it's also true for a uh, research parameter. So here uh, this table, this large table is showing uh, on every column a different state-of-the-art method for solving uh, contact problems or collision problems. So here we have something like six of them and every row here is a 
particular uh, simulation we want to solve. So for example in that corner there uh, what we are just trying to simulate is just a tetrahedron falling on a plane. Now you notice that every one of this uh, entry of this matrix is a tiny matrix on its own and this is why uh, the, the reason why we have that is because every method kind of some parameter to tune so for example the length of the time step or some uh, threshold distance and the color of the cell will tell us if the method succeed or not and we see that for something as simple as a tetrahedron falling in a plane some method have all green so everything is fine but uh, something like the method which is called ccd here may generate intersection if we have a large time step and a, a small threshold distance or something that could also blow up and this is interesting because the scene are particularly easy and the bad thing here is that if you are unlucky with the choice of the parameter and you end up in a non-green cell while well, your simulation will break and if you think back what you wanted to do is have this black box thing which is both for design and for example if you are inside an optimization pipeline this is extremely bad because if you have that parameter uh, thing uh, the parameter set it will not work and everything will just explode and the moment we make the scene more and more complicated, for example, I don't know, two cubes falling on each other, there is almost no green anymore. Or if you start having stacking more cubes, again, we start having more and more uh, problems. And uh, this is also a more complicated example. And if you move with something more realistic, like for example, a chain mail completely stuck, uh, or uh, a rod falling on a plane, or a cow head. Um, bouncing around, uh, nothing is uh, working reliably anymore. So the big question is why all these state-of-the-art methods are uh, failing so heavily and why there is so uh, many problems. And uh, well, one, one of the, the common problems uh, I would say is that if you think, if you talk with people uh, working in this field, what they want to do is to solve the collision with zero distance. So there is big assumption, big goal to say, well, when we have two objects colliding with each other, what we want is that at the very end they touch each other and they are zero distance, they are perfectly uh, there. And this is really, really not physical, And but before going there, I just want to tell you why this is a problem. In fact, uh, if you have this... Uh, separation, this uh, zero distance that you want, you end up with a constraint optimization problem. And there are more or less two big rules to take there to solve this kind of constraint optimization problem. The first one, which is convergent, is we can allow the constraint to be violated and then try to come back and recover. The problem is there is no guarantee that you can actually recover from violating the constraint, so you end up in a situation where you have interpenetration. The other kind of approach is this, we can try to enforce the constraint always, so never let them violate it. This is less convergence and it can create problems. But even if you allow for that, because of numerical problem, we may end up uh, violating the constraint numerically and we end up having interpenetration. And you can imagine the moment there is some little bit of interpenetration, if you are integrating over time, so running a... Uh, transient simulation, this interpenetration will become larger and larger and create more and more problems. And the biggest problem about interpenetration is their amount really, really depends on the setup. You can imagine if you have large velocity in the beginning or large time step, this more likely a stuff will interpenetrate and will have this uh, problem. So uh, now how we change that. So the main idea is that to change kind of mindset and never allow object to get closer to 10 to the minus 8. And in fact this change of paradigm, this change of mentality makes the problem tractable, makes the problem tractable robustly, similarly to the envelope in a tetrahedral machine. So this 10 to the minus 8 may sound like a magic numerical constant, but in fact this 10 to the minus 8 is uh, the space between atoms. So if you think about you're trying to simulate these two objects and you really never want them to be so close because the moment they get into close you start having atomic forces and you can imagine if you're lancing a ball against a wall and the atoms start colliding to each other you end up having different physics and nuclear reaction which is exactly not what you want. But this change and not allowing stuff to get close this allows to change the problem and transform the optimization into something that's solvable with Newton and a smooth barrier. So now we don't want object to get too close, so we just add a barrier which will prevent stuff and which go to infinity, which will prevent stuff to get too close and prevent them to collide. And this change now, this change allows the, the problem to be cast into a Newton with a smooth barrier, which is something much easier and more tractable to solve than a constraint optimization problem. 
So with this change, we can actually simulate something like a soft object like this. <coughs> Dolphin passing through a really, really thin funnel, and this is important. There is no parameter tuning, we just set up the simulator with a significantly large time step. And in every uh, step of this simulation, there is no collision. The funnel and the dolphin are always completely separate. Complexity of the dolphin and funnel simulation here, we have something even more complicated. We have this hairy ball which is bouncing and colliding against a piece of glass and the time step here is also pretty large 10 to the minus 3 and in the maximum uh, time of this simulation we have something like uh, 100,000 uh, collision happening and you see the whole thing looks really really natural and uh, physical and you may think about that we change kind of our problem now we don't have any more this hard constraint this uh, constraint of minimization problem we have this barrier are we really changing the physics are we still solving the same problem so to validate and uh, check that what we did is take a recorded footage of a golf ball uh, hitting a wall, match the material parameter and the boundary condition, so the initial velocity, and uh, on this slide we are showing uh, how our method is performed. And you see that it's perfectly in line and matches the uh, reality really well. I just want to add a note that someone playing golf told me that this is not a real golf ball, this is a training ball, a real golf ball is much uh, harder and doesn't deform too much. But nevertheless, the whole uh, simulation, our simulation matches reality pretty well and you also see this shock wave propagating uh, and uh, the ball bouncing back. There is no restitution model, the, just, the bouncing back effect is just done by the ball deforming and relaxing back. One nice part about our uh, reformulation of the problem is we can also handle codimensional objects. So codimensional object we can, uh, is something where we can have something like 1D colliding with something 3D and etc. Everything, the only thing we need for our primitive is to, able, to be able to compute and evaluate the distances. So for example, we can have this ball falling or this uh, piece of cloth falling on to the object. We also integrate a complete uh, friction model with the same principles. So instead of solving the real difficult uh, discontinuous friction model, we just uh, smooth it out and have something similar to our barrier so we can simulate something like a stack of cards uh, falling on each other. Now, before concluding, let me give you uh, a little bit of the limitation. So, the method is not interactive, it's slow, but not uh, much slower than uh, existing state of the art uh, methods. Another thing is that we don't have any uh, guarantee on energy preservation. Our experiment showed that there is some dissipation, which is good, uh, but we cannot guarantee to maintain uh, the friction. Another thing is, uh, if you ever try to work with, uh, with friction models, uh, you usually have two states. One is when you're sticking, and the other one when you're sliding, and there is a non small transition. You just jump from one to the other one. Again, for the same uh, reason, what we wanted to do is to make everything uh, smooth and uh, to be able to optimize for it, so we smoothed the friction model, so we smoothed the transition between the sticking and the sliding uh, regime, and this is also not completely physical, but uh, we again match with the experiment and it looks uh, realistic enough. And finally, which is more related to this course in particular, uh, we will be presenting in the next part uh, a complete package of Python library to run simulation, to do geometric computing more in general, and this part about uh, collision is, is new and it's not yet integrated in the, the Python packages. We expect to develop it over the summer. So I think this is all for uh, our uh, black box analysis uh, part, so thank you everybody for listening.